This past week, Val Dunicum died. It's been absolutely wonderful. I've, I, all the pressure is off me now. You know, I'm not trying to prove myself anymore. And, and uh, you know, I, I, as I said a while ago, I've been in a kind of an Olympic Games of show business for so many years, and nowadays I'm just doing laps of honour, really. From Colm Keane's documentary. I'm just enjoying looking back over it all now. It's lovely. From pigtails to wedding veils From pinafores to lace And in between are the special years Time never can erase in 1946, a young singer from Waterford began his career in popular music. In the next 50 years, that singer would become a legend of British television, starring at the London Palladium and achieving multi-million sales in the popular music charts. His name, Val Dunican. And in between are the special years you remember all of your life. I suppose in those days, this is an awful old cliche, I know, but in those days, of course, when there was no television around, you were mainly inspired by the radio and all, and all 78 records and everything. And I used to, to buy them and get involved in little sing-songs with all the lads. And even when I was a kid, you know, the, the lads I knocked around with, we used to go to the, to the, move, to the films in, in Waterford and we'd hear, you know, the Andrews Sisters and we'd go and see cowboy films. And I used to learn the little songs that people like Roy Rogers and that used to sing. And I would, even in those days, you know, I used to work them out in harmony and tell the boys what to sing. And then we started to do local concerts and it all sort of stemmed from there. Uh, we, <laughs> 50 years ago, we, we did a concert, I think, down New Ross or somewhere. And we were offered to take part because someone had heard us as a little carnival in Waterford and asked us if we'd come and sing a, s a song, a little duet. And we went along. I used to play a few chords on the guitar. So went along there. And we picked something that we'd heard in the movies again, you see. We used to copy the harmonies. And I did this thing, and we got ten shillings between the two of us for doing this concert. Val Dunican had a natural talent for singing, but he worked hard at it. He'd like to tell the story that it took him 20 years to become an overnight success. Mrs. Burke to her daughter said, Listen, Mary Jane, who was the lad you were cuddling in the lane? He'd long, wiry whiskers a hanging from his chin. Twas only Pat McGinty's goal, she answered with a grin. Then she went away from the village in disgrace. She came back with powder and paint upon her face. She'd rings on her fingers and she wore a sable coat. You bet your life she didn't get those from Paddy McGinty's goat. In my drawer here, you know, I mean, you're in my little study here now. Well, in the in the drawer over there, quite honestly, one of my life's treasures because I have in there all the theatres we played from 1951 to 1958 or something. And we did this, and at the same time, we did lots and lots of broadcasts and made records and did very early kind of television spots in those days as well. In this recording from a documentary by Colm Keane, Val Dunican explained his interest in those early years in arranging music. And all through that time, one of the things I used to do is I used to write the arrangements for the quartet, uh, you know, write the vocal arrangements. I'm very interested in doing that. And there was groups around at the time, like the Four Freshmen and the High Lows and all that, and we used to try to copy bits that they did for practice, and I used to try the arranging. And then I, I, st I went to somebody for lessons and started studying arranging properly for orchestras and that sort of thing. And then I used to do the backing arrangements for the orchestras. And strangely enough, that became the predominant thing then. I enjoyed that more than I did the actual performing then. I ain't gonna marry in the fall And I ain't gonna marry in the spring For I'm in love with a pretty girl Who wears a dime in the late 1950s, Val Dunican was introduced to his wife-to-be, singer Lynette Ray. That introduction came from actor and singer Anthony Newley, who also suggested to Val that he should consider a solo career. But I've got silver in the stars, gold in the morning sun, gold in the morning sun. 
Tony had a birthday one night while we were on tour. He had a birthday party, and we were all. He took over a little nightclub, and we all went. And we had a smashing night. And as as a cabaret, he said, "Now what I want everyone to do, I want everyone to get up and do something. But you mustn't do what you do in in the show. You've got to do something else." Well, of course, we were a quartet. We couldn't do anything else. You see, we couldn't tap dance or anything. So, I mean, Lynn used to do impressions, and she used to, and she got up, and a lot of people got up and did very funny little things. You know, one of the one of the singers in the show also played the trumpet, and he got up and he did a trumpet solo. Just so, when it came to us, they said, "Well, what are the four boys going to do?" And the boys kind of said, "Oh, Val will do something on his own." You see, so I sat on a stool with a guitar, and I started to do the old Delaney's Donkey and all those kind of songs with the guitar. And everybody was laughing, and I sang little American folk songs and stuff. And Tony came over to me afterwards, and he said to me, "It's none of my business now." He said, "Have you ever thought of doing that on your own?" Because he said, "I can tell you now, it's a much more commercial proposition nowadays than it is with the act, because by then the act was coming to the end of its time. Really, to be honest, you know, we'd been going for such a long time." And he said, you should, "Why don't you work on your own?" Now Denny O'Rafferty's motor car is the greatest, I declare. It's made up of bits and pieces that he picked up here and there. The engine must be ages old, but it's still got lots of power. With a gallon of stout and a petrol tank, it does 90 miles an hour. Val, when I, when I was a child... This is from the archives of the Gay Burn Show, but this is not Gay Burn. I, I, my first memory of a song is Elusive Butterfly and then Walked Hall. Hmm. And I see you now in the flesh for the first time. I saw you on television then, and you haven't changed. This is from the Gay Burn Show, mid-90s, when Joe Duffy presented Mondays and Tuesdays. Do you know, Joe, I think one of the, the, the great bonuses that came my way, quite by accident, was was the fact that I became successful quite late on in my yeah. career. And I've been in the business 50 years this year now. I started in 1946. And I saw so many people over the years, big stars that I worked mm -hmm. with, that when I was a supporting act, when I was with a singing group and that, and I used to support the big stars. And they used to come and go and come and go. And I, I realised that you, you've got to take this business a little bit philosophically and with a pinch of salt because you never know when it's going to end. And when I became successful back in 1930, uh, well, I was about 35, yeah. 1964, yeah. the time, like that, when I became successful, you know, I, I thought, well, it might last a year or two years and three years. And it's just gone on all the time. And I've never, I suppose, become kind of star conscious you know thinking yeah. I, mean, think, I, I never think of myself as what, what they you call know, a uh, star yeah. and all that, you know I don't honestly and I, I remember when I when I became successful on records when you're talking about Lucid Butterfly yeah. and all that and I can remember I went on top of the pops now me on top of the pops at my time of life you know I was in my late 30s and I go on top of the pops and I remember sitting on a stool one night in the top of the pop studio and the walker brothers remember the walker yeah, yeah, brothers yeah. they were singing they were singing a song and i was on next and there's all these little gyrating kids all driving <laughs> around the studio and two little young girls were passing chewing gum and one of them the two of them stopped and they started to laugh and one of them said to the other who's he <laughs> and the other one said oh, i don't know and there was a guy went back with what by with headphones one of the yeah. sound crew you see and she said here mate listen she said who's he and she, he said, oh, that's Val Dunigan. He said, he's number five in the charts. And she said, he's what? <laughs> Him? She said, God blimey, she said, isn't he old? And later in this interview, he noted his indebtedness to a former broadcaster here, Niall Bowden who gave him one of his first breaks. I spent so many years doing radio in the old days, because I did the old Donnelly Sausages programme back... Did you? Oh, gee, yeah, what? Back in, <coughs> back in, to be sure, it's the talk of the nation. Do you remember that? A sausage excitingly new, Donnelly's, didn't you? And of course, you were no, so young. Either. What are you, about 27? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Leave my IQ out of this. <laughs> you don't know me that well. Um, no, I, don't, no, do it for me. Do the jingle. What oh, we used to do, it, for some reason which I could never understand, the, 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 the little jingle to Donnelly's Sausages was written to the tune of the Mexican hat dance. You know the thing that... <laughs> And someone was paying for it as well. <laughs> That's right. Do you know I think? Da 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 And it was done fast. Oh, yeah, but if yeah. you do it slowly, you get the full impact of the lyric, which is a lot better. <laughs> and it used to go, To be sure, it's the talk of the nation, a sausage excitingly new. It's a food that has caused a sensation. And Donnelly's make it for you. And then the middle bit, Two wrappers for double protection. You couldn't <laughs> sing that nowadays, could you? Yeah. <laughs> 
Two, <laughs> I'll do that bit again. Go ahead, yes. Two, two wrappers for double protection, yes. the best that your money can buy. It's the last word in sausage perfection. Being skinless, it's faster to fry. <laughs> so the next time you visit your grocer, tell him no other sausage will do. To his other suggestions, say, no, sir, it's Donnelly sausage for you. Boom, boom, I did that. And, <laughs> And that went back, that was back in the late 40s, that one of your predecessors here, a fellow named Niall Borden, used to yeah, introduce yeah. the programme. And that was my first break in I radio. I think the Don, Donnelly sausages are gone. Mm, they are, yeah. I probably, they went bust after I sang that song. <laughs> 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 <I'll tell> <laughs> it was the double rapper, it was the extra class of the double rapper that killed him, apparently. That's probably it, yeah. He also talked about the first time he'd met Niall Borden, who had heard him singing, in an open-air concert in Bray in the summer of 1947. There was a bandstand along the seafront yeah. at Bray and, and they used to do a little summer show and I did a summer season there in, in uh, I think it was about 1947, 48 I think it was, I did summer season there and used to, they had a kind of a railings around outside the bandstand yeah. and they put deck chairs inside and anybody who sat inside had to pay threepence <laughs> to watch the show and anybody who stood outside the railings, <laughs> they went around with a box and they Away. put a penny in it, yeah, and I was up on the stage and I was there for the whole summer season and incidentally now Joe, one night I was on that stage singing with a pal of mine, we were doing little duets, yeah. and Niall Borden, the guy who yeah, used to do, his, yeah. uh, he walked along the seafront with his family or whatever, and he saw me, and he thought to himself, gee, these, these ch two chaps are very good. Yeah. And he came and saw us and said, would you like to make a piano, guitar, and bass, and vocals, yeah. and uh, try and try to come in and do do a broadcast for us. And then we came in, and we came into RTE down La Street yeah. Street to, to Radio yeah, Wales, yeah. to Radio. And we went in there and uh, did a couple of numbers, and they booked us for the for the program. And we became the Donnelly Music Makers, and we did that <laughs> we did that for a, a long time. And that was really the start of everything for me. You know, it was wonderful. He toured in Britain and he auditioned for BBC Radio. The burning question of the day is Rafferty's motor car. I did it for a series. And I used to sing very unusual songs, you know, little Irish songs I used to sing at that time. And, I'd, you know, I used to do the old things like Get Up Out of That Jimp and Brat and Let Mr Maguire Sit Down and those kind of things. And the poor announcer, BBC awfully like that, you know, and he used to make the title sound so silly, kind of, with that, <laughs> with that accent. So he said to me, I wish you'd introduce these songs yourself, you know, he said, because they, they sound so silly coming from me. And so the producer said, Val, suppose he just says, and now here's our special guest with the orchestra, and I, now what are you going to sing today, Val? And then you can tell them. So I did this a few times, terribly self-conscious about my Irish accent, because I'd never spoken on the radio. So I did this. And at the end of the series, they asked me if I'd like to, to, to make my own program of it next time round and introduce the whole thing. And that's how, that's how I got my own radio program. Trailers for sale or rent Rooms to let 50 cents No phone, no pool, no pets I ain't got no cigarettes About two hours of pushing brooms About eight by twelve Orbit room, I'm a man of means by no means, king of the road. He was later invited to perform at Sunday night at the London Palladium. And Val Parnell came in on the Wednesday night, and uh, the boss of the club came up and said, uh, Val Parnell is in, he'd like you to come and have a drink with him. And I said, really? I mean, really, it's uh, like being asked to have a drink with God, really. So I went down to the back and he was sitting there with Alec Fine and, and he said, you were really good tonight. He said, very good. This is not an easy room. He said, I enjoyed that. I'd like to put you on Sunday night at the Palladium. Well, of course, God. Honestly, I couldn't believe it. And I said, are you serious? And he said, I, I don't mess around about things like that. He said, so he got the diary out right away. And he said um, to Alec, when can we fit him in? He said, 28th of May, we could do it. And I jokingly said, oh, well, as it happens, I'm available that night, because I had no work at all. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I went and did the Palladium, and I can tell you now, talk about, I've, I've said as a joke many times, it took me 17 years to become an overnight success, and that was it, because the next morning, the papers were so full of this Irish fella, as if I'd just come over on the boat. And I'd never had write-ups in my life. I mean, I'd never done anything. <laughs> so, so I'd always been in the quartet, you see. So I sat down with Lynn and we looked at these papers and she said, isn't this wonderful? And a few of the papers 
described me as having a lot of natural charm. And I looked at Lynn eating a cornflakes across the table and I said, here, I said, what is this natural charm that I've got? And do you know what she said? She said, I think it's not knowing what natural charm is. And I think so. I thought, I'll leave it now and I'll never question what I do again. I'll just do it and hope that it'll work. I'll never try to analyse it or contrive it in any way. I'll just do it. Walk tall. Walk tall. Walk straight and look the world right in the eye. That's what my mama told me when I was about knee high. She said, son, be a proud man and hold your head up high. Walk tall, walk straight and look the world right in the eye. Column Keen again. Following the appearance at the London Palladium, Val Dunican was flooded with offers, among them recording contracts, a TV show, more Palladium appearances, and also the offer of a song from Shapiro Bernstein Music called Walk Tall. Walk Tall was released in the autumn of 1964, and Val Dunican's first record and first million seller was born. Walk tall, walk straight and look the world right in the eye. That's what my mama told me when I was about knee high. She said, son, be a proud man and hold your head up high. Walk tall, walk straight and look the world right in the eye. I looked around for songs and Shapiro Bernstein was one of the publishing companies and I knew a man named Peter Callender who was in the songwriting business and he sent me a little song called Walk Tall and I listened to it and I thought, I wonder with the kind of thing that I do on on television, by now I'm doing a little bit of television, I wonder if that would catch on. And I can remember making the record, I did the little arrangement for Walk Tall myself with the harmonica, and a man named Kenny Woodman did the other the other side, and we chanced it. I think it cost me about 350 quid to make the single, to make both sides of the single. And... Of course, it sold a million. His television career prospered, his ratings were phenomenal, he was compared to Bing Crosby. And then, quite by chance, in one early television programme, the director asked him to try a rocking chair. He shouted down, he said, Val, just sit in that chair for the last song. He said, just let's see what it might look like if you sit down and sing the last song. And um, so I sat down and did the last number, and... um, he said, looks great. What I'll do, he said, we'll finish on that and we'll bring the credits up over it. And just see, and that was in 1964. And do you know, I've never been able to get rid of that chair because, you know, if I go abroad, you go to Canada or somewhere, the first thing people shout, have you got the chair? You know, and are you going to sing Paddy McGinty's Goat? They're the two things they sing, have you got the chair? That chair gets more applause than I do. It's amazing. <laughs> And more from the late Val Dunican on Sunday morning next. Last week, Val Dunican spoke about being discovered on the promenade in Bray in 1947. I did summer season there, and used to, they had a kind of a railings around outside the bandstand, yeah. and they put deck chairs inside, and anybody who sat inside had to pay threepence <laughs> to watch the show, and anybody who stood outside the railings, <laughs> they went around with a box and they oh, put yeah. a penny in it, yeah. About his early career in Britain. And we do a week with... You know, with with Jimmy James one week, and then we do a week with Max Miller, and then we do a week with... And, you know, on a, just support, one of the supporting acts. And what he always called becoming, after 17 years, an overnight success. So uh, I went and did the Palladium, and I can tell you now, talk about... I've, I've said as a joke many times, it took me 17 years to become an overnight success. It was his Saturday night BBC television programme, first in black and white from the mid-1960s, which established him as a major figure. And that's where we start this morning's programme. When you do as much television as I did, I mean, my television show ran for 24 years. And when you think of the viewing figures you're getting every week in that time, and then accumulate them, I mean, it's a colossal contact that you've made. And I was doing a royal performance uh, some time back, and next on it was Paul McCartney. And I'd never met Paul McCartney. So... As we were chatting away, uh, Paul McCartney turned around and he spotted me, you see, and he walked over and said, Val, he said, I must say hello to you. He said, you have been so much part of my life and I've never met you and you've been in show business all the years I've been in the business, you've been in it, and I've never bumped into you before, but it's lovely to meet you. He said, because you were like part of the wallpaper in our house. You were always there on Saturday nights. 
all through the years you were always there and I'd never and it's lovely isn't it and all you're doing really is your job you're not only like a policeman on a corner you're just doing the job and and it, but you're having such an impact on so many people it's amazing beneath its snowy man for cold and clean the unborn grass lies waiting for its coat to turn to green the snowbird sings a song he always sings and speaks to me of flowers that will bloom again in spring. Paul McCartney may have remembered watching Val Dunican on television. Val himself made a point of not watching. Never. You know, I've never watched my television shows. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> I have no, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of mine at all, really. And I'm like a little kid. I go up in the bedroom and I hide away. I, c- I can't bear to watch myself, really. At its peak, the Val Dunican programme had 19 million viewers in Britain on Saturday nights, and it had the power to influence the music charts. The donkey was eyeing them, openly defying them, winking, blinking and twisting out of place. Riley reversing it, everybody cursing it. The day Delaney's donkey ran the half-mile race. It the became so popular that one day in the late 60s I had a letter from a young couple in Liverpool this couple wrote and said this girl said I'm the granddaughter or the great granddaughter of William Hargreaves who wrote that song and I've inherited the PRS you know and I just want to thank you because we've been able to put a deposit on a house with the money we've made from your recordings of of Delaney's Donkey. Isn't that lovely? I mean, it's such an out-of-the-blue thing to do, to be singing a little song from nowhere that you know nothing about, and what it means to the person at the end of the line who gets the cheque for the, for the PRS as it comes to. Wonderful. The TV programme also enabled Val Dunican to meet with and work with some legendary figures which he had always revered. When I was a kid, uh, Joe, the first, probably among the first records I ever had in my life were all 78s of Boy Life singing the little yeah. sort of Mr Frog went to yeah. court and then all these... A little, little bitty tear. Absolutely. Down. And I just thought he was wonderful. Yeah. And never, as I say on stage now, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that he and I would sing all those songs on American television together, you know, and all the, absolutely wonderful, yeah. like dreams coming yeah, through, yeah. it really is, and but when when we worked together, uh, I asked him if he'd like to come out to dinner, you see uh, during the, at the rehearsal time that we had at the BBC, so he came out to, to our house out in the country, I had a car pick him up and take him out, and the two girls were little at the time, and they were in bed, you see, <laughs> and uh, so Burl was sitting there and he's a huge man a huge yeah. man with a big beard well you know a big daddy yeah, you know what yeah, he looks yeah. like the, the, and he's such a gentle, beard, lovely yeah. gentleman yeah. and we were sitting downstairs having a drink before we had dinner and and he said uh, oh are these your children he looked at a little photograph of the two kids on the on the shelf and, and I said to him, oh he said aren't they lovely he said are they, where, where are they where are they and, and Lynn said oh oh they're up in bed oh he said could I see them well she said I don't know if they're asleep yet <laughs> so of course he goes up the stairs you see and we gently open the door and the two kind of in the dark you know you yeah. kids went, they both turned around the thumbs went straight in the mouth you know <laughs> and they turned around and sat up in the bed and there's this big gorilla yeah. standing at the door and frightened the life out of them you see and he went over and he sat on the bed and he kind of said to him you don't know who i am do you and they said no he shook their little head <laughs> and he said well i'm a friend of your dad's he said and with that he picked up the guitar and he said i'm going to sing you a little song now and he said fuzzy was he uh. was a bear now, the love, the thing, what I've always said, Joe, is the kids looked at him as if he was mad. You know, <laughs> they didn't know who he was. They couldn't, they wanted to go to sleep, you know. And the terrible thing was, there was Burleigh, one of my all-time heroes, sitting on the bed, singing to my kids, and they didn't know who he was. And I felt like getting into the bed myself, so they could sing to me, he could sing to me, because I thought it would have meant, and I've always described that little incident as being the greatest waste of excitement <laughs> I've ever known in my life. Because he, d- he died well, <coughs> he about did, a year recently. ago, and there was a uh, there was a resurgence of his. Uh, That's right. That I, when I went went when I d- kids did love us stuff. I did I did a lot of shows for America for Sir Lou Grade back yeah. in that time when you know when Tom Jones and all these yeah. and I did I did a, a series for ABC in America and I went off to America and I worked with Burl a bit. Now, when I got over there, to be honest with you now, Joe, that they, they, they kind of tried to. You can't blame television people for doing this, but. They, they, they looked at me doing my television thing, and I think they didn't quite understand why I was so popular. You know what I mean? <laughs> they thought, said, well, I can't see anything special about <laughs> exactly. this guy at all. You know, he's very bland, and it's very ordinary what he does. But, you know, but he is very popular, you see. And, and uh, well, what can we do to make it look a bit more exciting, you see? So, 
they more or less suggested that I should get a little bit sort of bejeers and bigorra and, and, oh, and got a little bit, and I said, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I said, I, that'll be an insult to my family and all yeah. the people at home. I, I couldn't do that, I'm sorry. You know, you either take me as I am or, or you think. Yeah. So they started to tart up the show a lot and make it all pseudo. We went over to the West and did some filming over around Connemara and it was all terribly Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to run away, really. I thought, this is not going to work, I'd like out. And Burl, bless his heart, was on one of the shows and we sat in the studio and he put his arm around my shoulder now like an old granddad and he said to me, you're not happy about all this, are you? And I said, I'm not actually, Bill, no, I'm not. He said, why? He said, are they trying to do things with you that, that you don't like? And mm -hmm. I said, uh, mm -hmm. then he said, go home, boy, go home. What you feel inside, he said, is a million times more important than anything they can ever do for you. So he said, if you don't like it, you go home. Forget the money, go back to what you were doing before, and, and that's exactly what I did. In the 1970s and 80s, Val Dunican was among the most popular Irish figures in Britain. He recalled his earlier years in this interview with Colm Keane, when Val Dunican was a singer on the circuit performing in nightclubs and provincial venues for little enough money. I can remember, in fact, going into digs one time up in the north of England some for a week and and I remember the the landlady uh, at the end of the week it was just me staying there with this old lady and gentleman he was a retired miner or something and I just stayed in their house for a week and at the end of the week the landlady said something to me which was such a revelation to me really she said Anyway, it's been lovely to have you, Mr. Uh, Val, she said. And you've been a very nice gentleman, she said. My husband was just saying last night, what a nice gentleman you are, she said, especially for an Irishman. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it that she actually said that to me. I mean, you've got, you got this kind of quiet guy who came in and did his, who did his work at the theatre and came home and had his supper and went to bed, you know. But I don't know what she expected from me at all. But that's what she said. My husband was saying he's such a nice chap, she said, for an Irishman. When he became a popular star on British television, the IRA campaign in the North was at its height. But Val Dunican never experienced any anti-Irish prejudice, as he tells Joe Duffy in this interview. In fact, many commentators have made the point, since he died, that Val Dunican's popularity was a very positive factor in Anglo-Irish relations in this difficult period. Have you ever suffered because of your Irishness, Val? No. In, in no. Birmingham or, you know, the bombings and... Yeah. P so many people have asked me that question over um, the years, you know, do, have you ever got sort of anti, any anti-Irish yeah. feeling? Do you know the only, I must tell you now, the only letter I ever got, a threatening sort of letter oh. I ever had, funny enough, was from a, a Republican sympathiser. When I appeared on the London Palladium in a remembrance concert, a big remembrance concert for the soldiers who died a, in the war. And a lot of them were Irish. And, you know? Yeah, and a fellow wrote to me and said, you would, I bet you wouldn't go up there and, and wear an Irish thing to, to sell because you're, you know, you're off now with the English and you're making money. And I, I found that letter so offensive, really, yeah. I did. I was very saddened by it, really. The angry voice is raised in vain the feeling deep inside of pain Sometimes I think it's not worthwhile Until once more I see you smile What would I be without your love I never know If I were free what could I do Where would I go I'm only me and I love you so Cliff came on the show one night now, Cliff Richard, and he, I remember he saying to me in the dressing room, which was a few, some years ago now, and I can remember him saying to me, you see, he said, I'm at an in-between kind of period now. I'm no longer a young bopper, you know, but at the same time, I haven't quite got the kind of maturity that you have, that you can kind of work with anybody. You can work with a little tiny girl or a, or a, anybody. You know, if there was a young girl playing the lead in a play and she's singing a little song, you can have, and you're like our granddad, or you're like our dad, you know what I mean? Or you can work with a really old person, and it doesn't seem out of place. You can work with kind of anybody, because you're like a father figure on television. You, you can do this because of your kind of age, and so on. And so it was very much to my advantage, I think. This little boy greets the snow with a smile that little girl has discovered an isle made up of pillows 
One little fellow is friends with the wind In the willows All of them children And all are mysterious people There's a lovely story actually They were at a, they were at a convent school And one of the things organised by the convent Was that all the kids went to this kind of junior prom At the Albert Hall Where they had a string quartet and a concert orchestra And uh, and also Rick Wakeman did a thing about rock and roll music and everything. And it was just broadening the kids' mind to the different kinds of music that are available to listen to, bits of opera and so on. So the, 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 the convent school got a bus to take them all down to the Albert Hall. And um, there was quite a lot of seats left on the bus. So they invited some of the boys from the, the boys' school down the road. Uh, and um, so they, all, they were all going off. And the boys were chatting up all these young schoolgirls and who were in their sort of about early teens, 13, 14, and they were saying, oh, did you see Kenny Everett last night? Wasn't that funny, that bit he did about the so-and-so? And, and, uh, and did you see him? And MASH, wasn't MASH good? And, so and Soap and these things that they used to watch in those days. And have you heard the new record by ABBA, whatever? And uh, so um, one of these girls very viciously kind of turned to these friends and said, did you watch Val Dunican this week? And this fellow said, what? He said, you don't watch him, do you? He's awful. She said, do you watch him? He said, my mum watches him. I think he's terrible. Do you, do you watch him? And she said, oh, no. I said, but that's his two daughters there. And the poor chap, who was obviously very well brought up, <laughs> he turned to my two girls and he said, I'm awfully sorry. He said, I didn't mean to be rude about your dad. That's awful. He said, I do apologise. I'm so sorry. And Fiona, typical young kid, not wanting to be left out, she said, oh, it's okay, she said, we don't like him either. <laughs> so she, she no, she's not concerned about the fact that I'm her dad. She's just terrified anybody might think that she liked what I did because that's the way kids, you see, they're terrified of not keeping up with their friends and, and, and being with it. And so you think to yourself, your poor kids are getting the brick bats all the time. <laughs> you know, are you, is Val Tunic and your dad? <laughs> even, even just recently, one of my daughter's in London, she's working in an office and a call came through from Belfast actually and uh, she was asking about something and, and my daughter said to her, look she said I'll find out all the details for you, she said so if you'd like to ring me back, I'll have them all written down, ask for me, she said, my name's Sarah Dunican, and she said Sarah Dunican, I just found she said, you mean like Val? and she said, yes, she said, he's my dad, oh my god, you poor thing she <laughs> said, <laughs> to my daughter <laughs> You poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's wonderful, really. And I mean, the girls now, you know, at that lovely age where, the, you know, you can sit and talk about all these things now, and you realise, you know, as I say, the immaturity of it all, you know, it's all so damn silly, really. Val Dunican's success brought many rewards, meeting some of his idols among them. He told Colm Keane this story about a Pro-Am golf classic with... Bing Crosby. When you do those things, they fly each person up in a little individual private plane and they're all in a long row in a little airport near Glen Eagles, a little octorada, there's a little line of planes. And I got out of my little plane with Lynn and uh, I was just coming into the little tiny airport building there and another one came down and I heard the guy saying, oh, he said, this will be Mr Crosby now, I think. And I said, it's Bing Crosby coming today. He said, yes, he is. This is him now, I think. And I thought, oh, I'm going to see him at last. I'm going to see Crosby up close. And he came in, and there's a couple of limousines waiting, you know, to take us to the thing. One was mine. And the next thing, Crosby came up, and he turned, and he shook hands, and he said, hi there, Val. He said, how are you? He said, I believe we're playing together today. And I thought, wow, I'm playing with... I can't even remember trying to hit the ball. I was so excited playing with Crosby. I really was. I was like a child. And I went around the golf course, and at one stage... I stopped, we stopped to play a shot and all the cameras were lined up and Peter Alice was talking to us and uh, there was a little boy standing there with his dad and I heard him say to his dad, that's Val Dunican, he said over there, can I go and ask him for his autograph? And his dad said, hang on a minute now. So I played, played my shot and this little boy came over and said, excuse me Mr Dunican, but could you sign on there, my name's Stuart or something. And I, I was wrote my name on this thing in a message to him. And, you know, he turned around to his dad and he said, Dad, he said, is the other man famous as well? <laughs> and I thought, well, that is show business. It really is show business, that. Because you're only as famous as anybody thinks you are. 
you can't ever prove it. You can't prove in this business you're popular. You're only popular with some people. You know, there's no there's no way of winning the war at all, you know. But is the other man famous as well? And I said to Crosby, I said, did you hear that? I said, I live out on that for the rest of my life. He knew me, but he didn't know you. One cornerstone of Val Dunigan's success was how he handled copyright on all his recordings. I should have known. I should have known. Decca Records had offered me a contract, so I used to do a bit of writing, and I, and she said to me, now you've got a few bob in the bank, you know, you've, you've worked hard and you've got a few quid in the bank, so you make your own record, you pay for it yourself, and I'll sell it, I'll, ha I'll lease the tape to the but but you'll own the records, and above here in the loft, just above our heads as we talk, are all the records I've ever made, all the master tapes are upstairs, I own them all. You know, and and I've just made my thirtieth album now, and I own all the ma the best advice I ever had in my life. I can tell you now: don't give anybody your records; keep them. You know, so Aladdin's Cave, my manager calls that because when I go to Australia, New Zealand, I can put together a compilation of songs, whatever they want, love songs, number ones, all the rest. Of, they're all there. You know, I know they're all dated now, a lot of them. You, know, but it's lovely that other people can't do it you see, and bring records out and you get nothing, you know. From pigtails to wedding veils From pinafores to lace And in between are the special years Time never can his most celebrated recording was this. And in between are the special years you remember all of your life. I get more requests for the special years than any other song because it's it's a song about children growing up and don't hurry, take it, take your time. And that's the kind of a sentiment, corny though it may be and sentimental though it may be, it's, it's a sentiment that is with us all the time because people are worried nowadays, I think, about how quickly their children grow up and how quickly they want to grow up. And they race through life, you know, they skip the pages, don't they? It's like going to see what happened at the end of the book. That's what life's all about now. You know, they start a book and they say, oh, I can't be bothered reading all this, I see who did it. And you can go to the end of the book. And life nowadays, I think, is so kind of immediate. Everybody wants results now. They don't want to do the apprenticeship of life at all. They want to rush through it and get all the, the rewards, what they think are the rewards at the end. And so that what they do really is they read the end of the book in the middle of it. And then the last bit of the book can get very boring, really. Sometimes in the morning when shadows are deep I lie here beside you just watching you sleep and sometimes I whisper what I'm thinking of my cup runneth over with love Val Dunican never forgot his Waterford roots or the beginning of his show business career on the Irish circuit. On his visit to Ireland when he was retiring, he joined Joe Duffy on that day presenting the Gay Byrne Show on radio and some of those who remembered him from those early years touring in Ireland phoned in to say hello and wish him well. S Silver Riders, and do you remember Silver Rider? Yes, there's an unusual. S Silver, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. How are you? Um, I'd just like to um, make a point about Val speaking on the um, 1947 show in Bray. Yeah. <laughs> I appeared on that show myself <laughs> with my twin brother Tony. Oh. We were known as the Ryder Twins. Oh, yeah. And we did a song and dance act for the audience. Gee. Uh, George Daniels had a, had a marquee there in Bray at that time. Yes, that's right. Just to put, Hal Roach was with him, wasn't he, for that, a while? That's right. Yeah. That's correct. And, yeah. And, um, 
The super effort <laughs> that show was a young lady called Tatty Dawson. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Kathy, yes. Kathy. And the they had the fairgrounds, didn't they, down the bottom? That's yeah. right. And um, the late Frankie Howard from Creed's Theatre fame, his wife Emily was the musical director. That's right. Yeah. That's correct. That's right, Emily oh, played yeah. the piano. I have photographs of her, actually, yeah. uh, with me on stage singing. God, yeah. I looked so good. I was about 21, I think. <laughs> and I was on there singing, <laughs> and she was at the piano behind me, old Emily. Do you know, I'd forgotten her name, actually. And, and Sil Silver, what yeah. happened to <coughs> Ryder Twins well, after? We went, we, went <coughs> off, we went off with uh, the fit-ups for several years, yeah. you know, and um, Daniels, George Daniels, brother not actually, uh, Albert, he ran the fit up, I mean, and we went on mm. touring with them for several years. S <laughs> Silver, is your, is your twin still alive? Tony, yes, he Tony. is. Tony, yeah. well, send our regards to him. Right. Bless you. Right. Okay, Silver, God bless Thanks a lot, Silver. Okay, Val, Thanks for ringing. Over a long career, Val Dunican had worked in fit-ups, in clubs, in cabaret, music hall, radio, television, and was also a major recording star. His was one of the most successful show business careers of his generation. I memorize moments that I'm fondest of. My cup runneth over with love. I was so privileged to be part of it, really. I really was. I was so privileged to be all in the middle of it all, and that, and for, to and to have gone right through it, and then through all the seventies and through the eighties, and you keep on going. You see, because you see, somebody said about about me some years ago as a, as a kind of joke, but it was absolutely true. You see. The one thing about Val Dunican is he said he never dates because he was dated when he started. You see, and that is true. I mean, that, that is very perceptive, actually. That is true. And it's great. I'm, I'm, you see, honestly, I'm not being modest now, but I think I'm very lucky that people still ask me to do it, really, at this time of my life. It's, it's, it's wonderful, really. Try to remember the kind of September when life was slow and oh so mellow try to remember the kind of september when grass was green and grain was yellow i remember my producer used to say we better put that there in the show because we've got Don Williams or something on at the beginning, and then we go. So that might, and then we got Jimmy Galway at the end. So that might be a bit, as she used to refer to it. I think that's a bit caviar for the general. She used to say. Now, some people in show business are like caviar for the general. Some people in show business are like kind of. <laughs> junk food in the business really and I think over the years I see I think I've been the sort of bacon and eggs of show business you know it's it's always pleasant to have nothing special about it but it's always pleasant deep in December it's nice to remember without a hurt the heart is hollow deep December, it's nice to remember the fire of September that made us mellow. Deep in December, our heart should remember and follow. Val Dunican was born on the 3rd of February 1927 and he died on the 1st of July 2015.